good morning again. I'm Dr. Thomas Griggs, as Whitney just said. Um, we are on an interesting journey here in that everything that you've already heard this morning is the perfect setup for what we want to talk about now for the next 45 minutes. Um, the poem from Thich Nhat Hanh was elegant, it made reference to um, mirror, the mirror surface of the water. Uh, and this is about how to uh, achieve a mind like water. And what I mean by that is that placid state of stillness and um, effortless efficiency. If you know the image of a mind like water, I think most of you probably do, given your interest in the Tao. Um, <clears throat> I have been teaching emotional competence to people that look like me. I kind of have a specialty in working with white guys and, and doing work around cultural differences. In the midst of those conversations, and I did not know that Whitney knew this about me. I mean, I don't know where she got it, but it was, um, it was true what she was saying about what I've done. Um, the, the, the conversations about cultural differences, about racism, sexism, classism, and so on, are uh, heavily value-laden conversations. And when people are in conflict about their values, emotions run very high. There's no way to be effective or useful in those conversations if we don't have a technology to deal with emotions. So what I'm gonna share with you today, it was born out of and refined in that crucible of working in those conversations. So what I'm going to share about emotions um, it is not academically uh, tested and validated in peer-reviewed literature, but where it's been validated is in the everyday conversations day in and day out. Uh, so I, I know, we know, my colleagues and I know that the, this particular way of approaching emotions is very useful. You know, it will work to solve, really uh, communicate anything you need to communicate and resolve any conflicts you need to resolve, basically. Um, so th that's, the, that's the practical context. There are so many applications of it. I'm thrilled to have this be the application uh, that as we um, look to uh, we pursue cosmic consciousness, we uh, have to go through the forest of human emotions. We have to go through uh, all of our personal experience. And at, a, at an ethereal level, we, I imagine that I am, um, I have a mind like water and I'm imagining that I am one with everything and so on and so on. And at a practical level, I have intrusive thoughts. I have persistent emotions and thoughts that get in my way. They interrupt me from my perfect state, as we might call it. So the purpose of today is, is to give you a, kind of a leg up on how to approach some of that emotional life, that forest, those trees of uh, all that stuff, and have something to do with those emotions. Um, it's good that we're recording this because today is an introduction. There will be a part two where we can go more into the application. This does take practice and it's, um, it gets easier and easier with practice. One of the things to know about how we do emotions as humans, and this is universal, um, there's a difference that's um, organized culturally. So there are cultural rules about how we express emotions. Men and women are raised to do them differently in this country and in cultures all over the world, there are rules about how to do them. In fact, that's one of the best ways to understand a new culture is to watch and listen and learn what the rules are about how to do emotions in that culture. Second thing I, I would say as a general context is the, the, the size of an emotion or the, the, um, 
visibility of the expression of the emotion doesn't really matter. That variable isn't important. How much noise somebody makes, how, how much they're demonstrative doesn't correlate with emotional competence. What correlates with emotional competence is the, is the ability to recognize which emotion I have and to know what it means so that I can act in accordance with its inherent purpose. That, that's what we're up to. So I'm talking about, you notice I use the phrase emotional competence. That's because um, it's not the same thing as emotional intelligence or emotional literacy. So to give you a definition, I would say that emotional literacy is the ability to distinguish an emotion from a thought and also the ability to recognize a primary emotion. Now that's literacy. Competence is the ability to take action according to that information, to make use of the inherent universal meaning and purpose of the emotions so that my actions are aligned and with right action. When I take the right action, the emotion that I have uh, resolves, it disappears. It is no longer necessary. It's fulfilled its purpose. So it goes away. The reason we have persistent emotions, at least in this view, is because we have not allowed the emotion to serve its proper purpose. And I'll give you examples of that in a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. It wasn't just Thich Nhat Hanh's poem, though, that was so perfect. That reading about Eckhart Tolle was also just perfect. Um, let me say, every thought draws us into thinking that it is important. It, it sort of suggests that it's, it's really meaningful and we get absorbed in our thinking. And um, <clears throat> we don't want to take our thoughts too seriously. Well, thank you, Eckhart, for teeing this up. That's beautiful. Full attention is universal, and we are joined when the speaker and the listener become unified in that process of listening. Thank you, Eckhart. Perfect, because what I want to share with you is what I call perfect listening. <clears throat> if we know how to listen to ourselves or another person for the meaning of the emotion behind our speech, the listener feels, whether it's me or the other person, feels heard, feels heard. If you have been listening for the meaning of the emotion that is driving what I'm saying, and you don't get distracted by all my thoughts, the thoughts are where it gets confusing. The same is true of values. That if you want to work in values conflict, if we can get to the meaning of the emotion, in the value, then we feel heard and our, we have the experience of our values being honored. But if we can't do that, we often have the experience that our values are not important or they're not being heard and they can't be validated. Oh, just in passing, um, Afton was talking about Irv Yalm's latest book uh, in 1975, Irv Yalm was a professor of mine. He, he taught us psychoanalysis. And I didn't know how important a guy he was. But just as an aside, and this is relevant to the conversation today, he was co-author with two other guys, um, Matt Miles and, and uh, Mort Lieberman, with a book called Encounter Group's First Facts. And it was the first rigorous study, and Mim, you'd be interested in this, the study of what is uh, effective about psychotherapy and all the claims that were being made in the, in the early 70s and late 60s about human potential and transformation. What approaches actually worked and why did they work? He was co-author of that very first book that did the research that um, uh, discerned what therapies were working and then later why. So it's interesting his name would come up. Everything's meaningfully interconnected with everything else. 
therefore everything is an omen or a reflection of something else. And so it's not a big surprise that we run into Irv in the same way that is it Paul and Bonnie ran into Eckhart Tolle in the park. It's, a, <laughs> it's all connected. Um, There are several reasons why it's working with emotions is difficult. Uh, the first one is that in the English language, the word feelings means way too many different things. It means so many different things that the fact that it refers to emotions gets lost. So I feel like you are not listening to me is not a feeling. I feel good, or I feel bad, or I feel fine. Those are not emotions. Those are judgments. They're evaluations of my emotional state or of something else. It could be evaluation of my physical sensations. I feel good, okay? It doesn't tell you the emotion. Uh, another reason dealing with emotions is tricky is because um, they, uh, we, we use cover words. Uh, things like uncomfortable or overwhelmed or stressed. And again, they're, they're purporting to, to tell you about my emotional state, but they're not identifying which emotional family I actually have. So neither you nor I know exactly what to do with my stress, distress, overwhelm, whatever the cover word is. So there are words like frustrated, which is a cover word because we don't actually know what you mean when you use it. I used to think that it meant blocked anger until I had a client one day for whom that wasn't true. <laughs> for her, she was sad. And when she felt sad, that's the word she used. So I, I learned that it's, there's not a rule about that. We have to ask what somebody means when they use a cover word. Another uh, barrier is the fact that we, we engage in substitutions because of the cultural rules of, that we're, uh, we grow up with about what's okay to feel and what's okay to recognize and share with somebody else, we substitute one emotion for another. And we have names for those substitutions because they're so common. So, the substitution of anger for scare, for example, I feel scared and then I act angry or I feel scared and I don't know it and what I feel instead is anger. That's a paranoid response. <clears throat> and it, it's also a macho response. So substitutions, cover words, um, a confusion, the inability to tell the difference between emotions and thoughts, all those things get in the way. So if we are, and this is the purpose of our time, if we are to have an understanding of our emotional life for the purpose of finishing persistent intrusive emotions or being able to set them aside more easily, um, then I forgot what the beginning of my sentence was, but it'll all, all come back around. Um, one thing is about clearing emotions. The other is about expanding our vocabulary. And this group is already really good at that, but a lot of groups aren't. Expanding the vocabulary of positive emotions. So the more we use a word to describe an emotional state like peaceful or joyful, powerful, empowered, the more that experience lives in us. We grow our emotional experience by virtue of using the proper labels. We, we teach ourselves to recognize those states. Um, I helped write up protocols for a parent support group for parents of children who were <clears throat> involved with substance abuse, addiction. It's basically a, a adapted 12 step kind of meeting. And I helped write up the protocols. <clears throat> and I realized that um, 
we were all agreeing that serenity was important, but there was no provision for us to actually feel serene. There wasn't a provision for us to practice the experience of serenity, of knowing that that was our emotion and dwelling in it and deepening it, practicing, experiencing, feeling serene. <clears throat> we were referring to it all the time with slogans and um, little speeches that we always made, but there was no place where we we're actually intending to feel it. And when I tried to build it in, somebody actually objected to that. They, they didn't think it was appropriate, that, which reasons I don't need to go into. Uh, cultural reasons, the cultural prohibitions against feeling something or telling somebody what they're supposed to feel. Even though it was an invitation, it wasn't a requirement you know, that people feel serene. So, Good, we're pretty much on schedule. <clears throat> Sorry, it's, I'm in Seattle and it's the same time as it is for you in LA, but my voice is not fully woken up yet, I think. I'm gonna share my screen and then I'm gonna flip through some slides. And you may want to take notes if you're in a place to do that. Otherwise, <laughs> thank you, Amy um, and Patricia, otherwise, if you all just intend to remember one thing or two things, collectively you will remember what we have and you can ask each other. Plus this is also being recorded. <clears throat> so um, I hope I have permission to share screen. Um, let's get the... Okay, I think you can now see that, correct? Can I get a nod? Yes, can you see that? Yes, you can see it. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna leave it the way it is and not try to clean it up just in the interest of time. <clears throat> I like that Meister Eckert said, the purpose of meditation is fulfilled in action. To me, that is the dialectic between that mind like water the emptiness so that higher wisdom can reach me. And the fulfilled in action is being in the real world with real emotions. I relate to it that way. <clears throat> Developing a mind like water then, here are some steps to, to do this. Defining emotional competence, which I just did talking about distinguishing emotions from thoughts, identifying the primary families. I will show you their behavioral purposes in a minute if you've not seen that before. I mentioned that accounting for substitutions in emotions is uh, something to get to a deeper, more accurate level about working with our emotions. And I mentioned that right action resolves emotion. Um, my anger or my fear or my sadness will completely disappear when I have done the right things so it fulfills its purpose. And that's what we mean by clearing an emotion. So literacy, to differentiate the ability to differentiate thoughts and feelings. The thing that I'd note here is that, has anybody read uh, Daniel Goleman's original book called Emotional Intelligence? You know how popular that was? It set off a firestorm of um, it's still going on, all this literature, this whole movement about emotional intelligence. Now, wouldn't you think that in this seminal book that you would be able to find a list of emotions? I thought so. And I went through the entire book and only at the very end did I find a page with a lot of words on it, which Goldman says are emotions. But I looked at it and I knew they weren't emotions. There were judgments and interpretations and sensations and all this other stuff, cover words and stuff and combinations of emotions. 
uh, but there wasn't a, a list, clear list of primary emotions. So I went back in the footnotes and I went, where did this come from? It was a list of words that a composition professor had given her students at a college in New York City to help people write more expressively. And he was holding that out as if it were a list of emotions. So clearly, even the guy that that's, writes the book and launches this movement about emotional intelligence, he himself cannot tell the difference between an emotion and all these other uses of the word feeling, which is interesting because now that whole field has evolved into what they're calling social intelligence, which maybe is a little more useful because it's not as confusing. Competence, um, skill to take the effective action according to the inherent purpose and guidance of our primary emotions. How you tell the difference. Uh, thoughts are, I feel like you're not listening to me. I feel you have done a good job at X, Y, Z. I feel as if I am coming into my own these days. It, just because it starts with I feel doesn't mean that you're going to get an emotion. If it's a paragraph or a speech or a sentence, it's going to be a thought. Very simple spot. Because emotions are adjectives. They're one word adjectives. And those are the six that I'm offering up for you. Pretty much everybody agrees on mad, sad, scared. But I'd like you to, and I've dropped some others that people like to put in like disgust, because it's just not useful in solving problems and whatever we're doing. Academ academics like it, but I don't find any use for it. Peaceful, powerful, and joyful are especially important for a number of reasons. One, many of us have a goal of achieving serenity, peaceful. And empowerment is a particularly important concept in working to uh, eliminate racism, to um, challenge oppression. If people in a group say they are feeling empowered, that's really important information. And if they're saying they don't, that's important. So we do need the currency of the word and the family of powerful emotions. And each one of these words is a representative of a family of emotions. Same with joyful, you know, excitement and, uh, and so on. There, it's useful to distinguish those because we may have deficits in one or the other of those families. Might be good at peaceful, but not good at powerful or might be good at powerful, but not good at joyful. So um, moving along, I've already said that. Thoughts are complex sentences and so on. Emotions are one word adjectives, universally experienced, universal language because they're recognized by all ages and abilities, meaningful and purposeful. Talk about the barriers, covers, cover words, combinations and substitutions. The way to work with combinations like guilty, jealous, and ashamed is to break them into their component primary parts. So if you'll notice, um, like some jealousy is notoriously difficult because it's got everything in it. If you think about it, you know, I'm, I'm mad because you went out with that guy and I thought you were my girl. You know, this is me talking at 15 years old. Um, I'm, I'm mad about that. I'm also scared that I'll never find another love. I'm mad and I'm scared. Um, I'm sad because I've lost you and your attention as if that were a possession of mine. But I also still care about you and still love you. So I've got positive emotion along with mad, sad, and scared. So since I am being pulled in at least four different emotional directions. And I'm being, uh, I've got four different vectors of my energy. No wonder I act crazy, crazy jealous. Of course I do. The solution is to just take them one at a time and resolve them. And I will never forget the day I figured that out. I just happened to be visiting Seattle years ago, back in the late 70s. And I was in a struggle with my girlfriend at the time. 
And I was just all confused, all snarled up. And I knew the theory. And so I said, I need to take some time. And I went off by myself and sat at the top of these stairs looking out over the water. And I went through each one of my emotions. And I, I, it was a huge breakthrough. I came back down. And I said, okay, here's what's going on in me. This A, B, C, D, and E. That's why I've been paralyzed. Because I didn't know how to talk about this. Hmm. So that's combinations. That's covers. We've talked about those. Primary emotional families, here we are, we're getting down to the meat of it. And if you will, let's pause for a moment and um, I'm actually gonna stop sharing for a second. Now there's an intrusion with the screen sharing and our connectedness here with the pictures of you all. I regret that, but um, if you will take a moment and um, relax, and if you will, close your eyes for a moment. And in that state, sitting there, what do you become aware of in your mind? What are you aware of? Maybe your mind is completely empty. Maybe you entered cosmic consciousness effortlessly. Or maybe like many of us, there's something going on in there. What is going on in there behind your eyes? Are you aware of thoughts just effortlessly appearing? Are you aware of emotions, sensations? What, what is going on? And if you will, see if any thought comes up, any thought or feeling, any emotion that you've had, and don't worry about being organized or perfect about what a primary emotion is right now. Don't worry about that. But have you had any recurring thoughts or feelings uh, this week, the past few days, about anything? Has there been anything in your mind that troubles the waters of your placid mind? And be gentle with this. Uh, if you find something that is a recurring thought or feeling that you would like to use to investigate what we're talking about, go ahead and retrieve that experience and gently bring it back with you as you come back with your eyes open to this connection we have with each other now. It's very useful to become a scientist and study our awareness or our thoughts or our emotions. The simple act of observing them scientifically or objectively studying them gives us a, a really interesting uh, positive power and control over that mental experience. And classifying them helps us manage them. It's very helpful to think about emotions is kind of the shorthand of that. So if you retrieve something, as we move forward now, I'd like you to be listening to what we're about to talk about and apply it to whatever you, re you retrieved, whether it was a thought or an emotion. If it was a thought, an idea, um, be listening for the emotion behind the thought. If it was a transaction with somebody else, be, be aware of whatever the emotion was in you as you listen to them or the emotion in them, if that's where your energy is. 
because we can either use this to listen to ourselves or to the other person. Now let's get a little more specific about what we're gonna do with it. The first step is knowing which emotional family I'm dealing with. The mad family has a lot of words in it, annoyed, resentful, pissed off, angry, livid. Some are small, some are big, but they all hopefully clearly signify the family of mad or anger. I've found it useful for a group of people to agree to use these six words as presented here in order to clearly connect us into the families we're referring to. Because we all have such a private language about emotion that when we use our own pre existing vocabulary, we become disconnected from other people because they're not using the words the way we're using them. The words are not attached to the same experience that we think they're attached to. So definitionally, it's helpful to stick with mad, sad, scared, peaceful, powerful, joyful for a while. Sad has its own spectrum of light to heavy, you might say. So does scared. Uh, if somebody's on the phone and you can't see this, um, sad is down, depressed, blue, lonely, grieving, mourning, uh, clinically depressed all the way out. Scared is nervous, worried, anxious, hesitant, um, embarrassed, possibly all the way up through panicked or terrified. Again, size is not the issue. Some people experience being terrified, but the process is the same as if you're nervous. So we don't have to get distracted by the volume of the emotion. We listen for the meaning, which is coming up surely. peaceful in that family, serene, secure, calm, so on, so on. Powerful, strong, confident, proud. There, it's not power over, it's empowered. Joyful, excited, happy, playful, etc. And there are other places where there's longer lists of what's in the families. Now, here's the punchline. Here's what we're up to. That the meaning of mad is that a violation has occurred. So if what came up for you in your retrieval a moment ago was that there's some resentment going on, exactly what is the violation that you've experienced? If you know the exact violation, then your behavior has a chance to succeed because the purpose of anger is to empower you to reset a boundary or to defend that boundary that's been properly set or to renegotiate an agreement that was broken. And people that are not good at being angry are also not good at setting or protecting boundaries. It's very highly correlated. Okay, so the steps are knowing the emotion, knowing what meaning I'm looking for explicitly in the situation, and then taking the specific action associated with that. Same process is true, and I can do this in my mind or with one other person or with a group. I can even do it publicly. If the violation occurred at the public level, like on social media, then I may need to reset the boundary using social media. It doesn't work to reset a boundary at the wrong level from which the injury occurred. And people make that mistake, it's switching levels in order to address a grievance of some kind. And it won't work because it's not matching the level of the original offense. Sadness signals a loss universally. If any of you picked up some loss, 
in your retrieval exercise. What exactly is lost? It might be a relationship. It could be something you expected. It could be the fact that in my mind, I have flexibility and balance and strength and skill to climb rocks. And then I realized I don't have what I used to have. I can relate to that. Then what do I do with the recognition of that loss? I, I, it's connection and validation. It's I secure the, the time and the connection with someone else, so I don't do this alone, to validate the significance of that loss. And anybody who's ever worked with death and dying or grieving and mourning knows that the best way to prolong a grief response is to dishonor or invalidate the significance of the loss. Conversely, the way to help somebody through that process is to repeatedly validate the significance of the loss. And you do it with people, okay? Um, we do that by telling stories, uh, by listening, by um, talking about why something mattered, why somebody mattered. And that, so the process is very doable if we just know what it is and we apply it to the right us. So uh, a helper, a support friend can help clarify these things back and forth with you. Scared universally means there's danger, risk, some kind of threat. Might be real, might be imagined. It doesn't matter. If I get protection for it, it's resolved. So when my son uh, was little, he thought there was, actually it was my daughter. Um, she thought that there was uh, maybe a monster in the closet. And I knew there wasn't. So I said, there isn't. Go to sleep. How well do you think that works? Not at all. So I realized my mistake and I went, oh, okay. So I opened the closet door and I said, listen, no monsters allowed to come out till the sun comes up or unless I tell you, you can come out. You got that? Okay. And I close the closet door. I say to her, are you okay? She says, I'm fine. The threat was secured by the protection that was appropriate to danger. For loss, uh, going back to my son, he lost his favorite bunny rabbit. We couldn't find it anywhere. And I told him, you know, don't worry, we'll get you another one. Or I said something completely ineffective, invalidating the significance of the loss. Realized my mistake. I went back and I said, you know, that was the best bunny that ever was. And we talked about it. Remember the time, you know, the dog chewed it up and we had to sew it back together and time we left it on the subway in Atlanta and I had to chase three exits to get it back. And yeah, you know, and we told stories about it. After a while of honoring the significance of the bunny, I said, do you want another bunny? He says, no, I want a dinosaur. So, you know, we evolved toward cosmic consciousness, obviously dinosaurs. So you see how it works. It works at all ages. If we get the right uh, meaning, then we know the right purpose. Peaceful, powerful, and joyful indicate we're on the right track. They say, repeat whatever we're doing. Do it again. Do it deeper. Do it more often. Do it in more places. Okay? That's our template. That's how we move through this. Now, um, key points to remember. Clear some emotions that you want to be done with. Others, you don't want to be done with them. You want to deepen them. Peaceful, powerful, joyful. Size or, or the drama with which an emotion expresses is not correlated with personal change. Cultural differences influence how emotion is expressed. But the meaning is the same universally. Therefore, you can talk to anybody in any language, whether you know the language or not. That point is made beautifully in the book, The Alchemist. Those of you that love that book, um, I just finished listening to it on Audible about three or four times over. Um, I wanna just say we've got a minute or so left. I wanna make this distinction about meditation that um, with cognition, I ask for serenity and with thought, I pray for peace. I take the action of breathing in and out and letting go, inhaling, exhaling. And in meditation, 
I intentionally practice deepening the emotions of peace and serenity. Now, and I know an empty mind is not deepening emotion. An empty mind is an empty mind. There's nothing there. It's not, there's no thought or emotion either way. But there is a place in some types of meditation for deepening the emotion. And if I forgive myself, for example, mentally forgive myself, tell myself I am forgiven for some, something I've done in my life, but I do not experience deep emotional peace. If I don't experience peace emotionally, what have I achieved? I've achieved the thought of blessing or grace, but not the experience of it. So being clear about this is helpful to somebody like me who was raised to not have any emotions at all, or if you did, you're going to get in trouble for it. It's useful to make the distinction so I can I can intentionally have the emotion and I can tell you about it if I want to. Okay, this is gonna have to be next time. There's too much involved, but I mentioned it briefly. There are levels of purposeful action. Once I know the meaning and I'm gonna take action, there are different audiences that I can take that action with, different arenas in which I can, I can get my protection or I can reset the, boundary violation, or I can uh, validate the significance of the loss, or I can deepen my joy, my peace, or my empowerment. I can do it in these different arenas. Now, um, I'll just go back to this one more time. Hopefully, you can record this, the flow of the meaning and purpose of the emotional families. Um, okay, so you see why this is part one and part two. Can we just take a minute? Do I have another minute? Can I steal a minute from you? Uh, um, or not? Just in one minute, probably, yeah. Okay, okay, in that 60 seconds, if anybody wants to put in the chat um, any connection that you made about this, go ahead and do that. If you want to include it in your check out, you can do that if that's useful. Otherwise, um, you can listen to the recording again and come back next time for part two, which I believe is May 31st. Yes, it is. In two weeks. Uh, we will pick up here and, and talk about actually working this practice in very specific circumstances to the ones that you retrieved or the ones that you bring with you on the 31st. So, exhaling gratefully. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Amy. Oh, yeah, the substitutions. Ask yourself, which one is your most frequent or the easiest for you and which one's the hardest? Because that'll be what your substitution pattern is. And that's that information is gold. Okay, great.